You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast coming to you from Montecito, California here. And today I am going to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about, well, I guess mental health issues. Not really mental health issues, but just about, you know, quieting your brain. And that's what this show is going to be all about. And it's really funny because I had to record this intro about five times because I've got like 10 things going on at once and leaving a little business trip tomorrow. And it's uh, kind of all over the place. So it made me think, gosh, I really need to play this show. And it is about quieting the monkey mind. The monkey mind, of course, uh, defined by many meditating uh, gurus out there. And ultimately, this show is J.F. Benoit's take on what that whole monkey mind thing is all about and how to quiet it. Hopefully, you'll get something out of this as a, you know, a little bit of a change of pace to our usual focus on macroeconomics and personal finance and that sort of thing. You know, because at the end of the day, it's all about, uh, you know, holistic wealth and mental health is part of that. So with that being said, we will be back right after these messages with J.F. Benoit talking about the monkey mind. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, my guest in Wealth Formula podcast is J.F. Benoit. Now, he is a health pioneer in uh, mental health, and he's also a best-selling author. His specialty is teaching people how to quiet the negative voice in their head and instead develop a powerful new mindset that creates long-lasting change. He's the author of Addicted to the Monkey Mind, Change the Programming that Sabotages Your Life, and we'll talk about that as well. But in the meantime, welcome to the show, JF. Buck, thank you so much for having me. Great to have you know a change of pace. We talk so much about uh, personal finance, and we talk about success and finances, uh, how to make money, how to grow money, all that stuff. But there's other stuff to consider when it comes to wealth, and it's more holistic. But along that way, um, there's also a lot of things that involve that go through people's uh, minds and their lives during the process of creating wealth. And one is, you know, the the idea that there's a you know, a little bit of a fear uh, that often holds people back from getting to their financial goals in the first place. Now, I, I know you've worked with a lot of people uh, who are higher performers that are maybe they've not come from a lot of money before. But, you know, what what drives the fear of financial success that sometimes can hold people back? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think most of us are not aware of actually the simplicity of where anxiety actually comes from. So uh, what I like to refer back is kind of like a nervous system that is dysregulated, okay? And most of us overuse our analytical mind to trying to solve all the problems that we're facing, and we don't realize that that tool is really helpful, but it's not helping your nervous system. So if you're not attending to your nervous system, then what's going to happen is that your mind is going to keep spinning and maybe sometimes you find solution, but even when you find solution, your anxiety is not going away. So if you don't learn to attend to your nervous system, then you're basically repeating the same pattern and using the wrong tool for the job. So to give you a simple example, you know, if you were, if you observe a child who's really upset, right, and you look at the child and you start telling them to stop to be upset. You know, that's using the analytical mind to try to solve the problem. How's it working? Well, you're going to observe it doesn't work very well. Versus if you simply say to the child, wow, I see that you're really upset right now, or I see that you're really anxious right now. So the nervous system speaks a different language. It needs to be seen and it needs to be acknowledged. And for most of high sort of high functioning people, we sort of learn as if the that what's going on in the nervous system is something to ignore or something to treat as it's a weak, it's a weakness that we might have. And it's none of that. The truth is that when we are in anxiety, we need to learn to attend to it. When you have that kind of uh, self-sabotaging fear, I mean, what are, you know, what are some of the actions that somebody can take just examples of tools that you can use? You overcome the fear of 
success maybe, or, you know, uh, make it so that you don't self-sabotage yourself? Yeah. So a lot of anxiety is directly correlated to our sense of self-worth. And most of us are not aware of that. So meaning what happens if I, if I fail at my business or if I fail at my business deal or in my investments or what happens? Well, it, you could say analytically, okay, well, I'll get over it and I'll move forward or I'll just, you know, that's the analytical mind looking at it. But at the nervous system level, there's a place deep down in our core that we associate that with being a failure ourselves. And that's not the same as failing. And, you know, in, um, you know, there's a great book, you know, from good to great, right. That a lot of us have read. And if you look at one of the research that, that, that I think is really important to pay attention to is he said that he found out that the difference between a good leader and a great leader was that a good leader, when they were anxious, they're trying to get rid of the anxiety versus a great leader thrives on their anxiety. So how do you thrive when you have a fear that seems to be so dominant about it? Well, you have to understand that it's not personal to you. And if you're making it personal to you, that's why the anxiety is persisting. So you have to be able to attend to that belief system that exists and it's not analytical. It's like there's a part of us that believes that somehow we're not enough if we fail at this. Right. And that's a, different mindset than people who are charging fully and say, yeah, I'm great regardless of what happens. I think the, the, uh, in my, uh, you know, amateur psychology, the way I think about it, you know, I am, you know, part of this cohort that is a, you know, the A students in school, you know, I went to medical school, neurosurgical residency, you know, and, and so on and so forth. It's sort of the, you know, uh, the, the typical success, academic success story. But what's not typical about me is that I went an entrepreneurial route that required significant amounts of risk. Mm -hmm. And um, what's always interesting to me is when I am in a group of successful entrepreneurs, when I, you know, that different kind of cohort of mine, I am frequently the only one in the room who has any kind of significant, successful academic pedigree. And so mm. for me, uh, one, of the, the, uh, uh, one of the hypotheses that I have is that the early success of A students, highly successful academic types who end up in medical school and law school and all the professional schools, creates even more anxiety towards the potential of failure because right. of such a positive, strong, constant feedback of success. And, right. um, and, you know, basically not having that feeling of, of, of knowing what to do with failure. What do you think of that? Tell me, uh, of course I'm playing armchair psychologist here. So, but I, I'm curious what your take is. Well, what you're describing is that we are performance based and that's not the truth about us. You're not a performance right? You can do well at something, you have skill set, but that doesn't make you a good person or a bad person. What makes us great people is the values that we possess and the values that we live by. So, but the nervous system doesn't know that. Meaning that when you fail at something, your nervous system is associating that with a performance. Say you didn't perform well here, so therefore you're not enough. And we have to come to an understanding that's not logical. So one of the skills that I think is super important to develop is to be present in the nervous system. So I develop this circular breath that I do, and I do it a couple times a day for about 15 minutes. It doesn't need much more than that. But if you develop this sense where the nervous system needs to be seen and needs to be witnessed, and once it feels like you're giving it attention, it actually starts to shift and then you can use your analytical mind to verify the construct and the beliefs you're operating from. The sequence is missing for most of us because most people don't learn to breathe. Most people don't learn to first be present with the anxiety and, and, and acknowledging that that anxiety possess intelligence in it, right? So that performance you're describing is, is epidemic in our society and especially for high achievers, it haunts us, right? We just, we just can't imagine 
not succeeding. And it's like, and, and if we do, it's, it's, it's like even unconsciously driving our bus. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about, um, specifically the, the title of your book and it's the addicted to the monkey mind. So what exactly is the monkey mind? So the monkey mind is a conditioned way of thinking that was developed. Uh, most of our programming occurs between the age of one and seven and usually gets reinforced between seven and 20. And what that is, is just like, think of a simple for us, high achiever, the comment might have been, why didn't you do your homework? Uh, the conditioning might have been uh, that you just look up to your dad, who's very successful, or your mom. And so the conditioning is like, oh, I need to be like that. Or, um, you know, don't cry. Uh, don't be a sissy. So whatever it is, like, you know, sends the message that if I cry, I'm weak. Um, so there's all kinds of different forms of conditioning that happens depending on the type of family we're raised in. And this conditioning, uh, which is we call the monkey mind, it is, exists sort of as a memory system in our, in our nervous system. And so what happens is when we get triggered and we get emotional, that's when the, this monkey mind becomes active. Right. It's not like when you're operating and you're functioning just fine and you're not having high fluctuation of emotion, you're just you're not under the monkey mind spell. But as soon as you are triggered, then you are definitely operating from that. And it requires, you know, like the book talks about developing an observing mind in order to be able to basically uh, give what I call is that this monkey mind and this conditioning needs integration. And why, as soon as we learn to integrate it, take responsibility for it, integrate it, then it doesn't have a hold on us. And for a lot of people, I can tell you that the easiest way to, to find out about your monkey mind is, is in your personal relationship, you know, like your, your marriage, your relationship with your children, and, and, and oftentimes your relationship with your coworker or the people that work for you. So you're... Uh, I guess I'm trying to break that down a little bit so I can understand it. When you talk about the monkey mind, then it, are you saying that that's sort of your raw, you know, your id, uh, you know, in the ego in the inverse to id kind of thing, where that you know what what that what you developed when you were young, whatever you know, lashing out you do, or the you know, holding your breath and standing in a corner or whatever, uh, that is you know, the part of you that you're referring to is the monkey mind that gets reverted to in times of anxiety? Yes. It's a false sense of identity. So meaning think of the performance identity is if I do well, right, then I am worth something. I have value. But if I don't do well, I don't have value. So now I'm trying to operate out of a system that will cope to make sure that I perform. And then if I don't perform, I'll have some coping mechanism that most of us are unconscious that we've developed to try to attempt to deal with it. But all they do is make us feel more anxious. I mean, some people ultimately will, re you know, revert to drugs or alcohol to try and to suit their nervous system, you know, when that happens. But other, other, other people might be overworking. Uh, they might never be able to relax, right. And read a book and just sit in, you know, so yeah, it's a false sense of what gives us value, you know, which is what the id really is. It's, it's a false sense of who we are. We're not a performance. What is the observing mind then? That's the, the, is that the, the, um, way to basically kind of look in at the monkey mind intellectually? Yeah, it's, it's both. It's actually a physical experience. That's why the breath is so important, right? So the, the observing mind is, is, doesn't have an agenda. It's about witnessing, witnessing energy that feels that we, that's operating in the body, witnessing emotion, witnessing thoughts, right? It's like one of my, you know, a quote that I really like, it's like, think of it this way. It's like, I love my thoughts but I'm never tempted to believe them. And, and so it's like that illustrates the relationship of the observing mind wants to be able to observe things before it decides whether I should believe X, Y, Z. But if we don't leave space to observe what we're doing, 
what we're feeling, then we're just operating from that conditioning. How, uh, you know, a lot of what you talk about here and what you're referring to when you kind of are looking at thoughts outside of, you know, um, kind of looking in um, are some of the same tenets that, uh, uh, of mindfulness meditation and that sort of thing. Is this different? It's different in terms of, you know, uh, meditation and there's a, so many different forms of meditation. There's different forms of breath. Um, So I think what's important is to realize that witnessing and an observing mind cannot have an agenda. You know, uh, some of the great spiritual people who have used meditation, you know, I've heard some of them say, you know, it took me 20 years of meditation to figure out I wasn't meditating. And it's just like, so think of if we have an agenda, so I'm going to sit down and meditate. Why? Because I want to feel calmer or because I want to be more at peace, or because I want to solve my problem or my anxiety. That's an agenda, and that is not what we're talking about here. And that will eventually create a problem because the nervous system, the emotion system, everything that exists in our body as an experience needs first acknowledgement and to be witnessed and be seen. And that can only be done by witnessing and not having an agenda. Versus if we have an agenda to feel calmer, we're saying to, we're sending a message to the anxiety. You're not welcome here. I'm looking for calmness. I'm not looking for anxiety, but the anxiety is already here. So how can you not be looking for it? It's already there. I think you have some, uh, actually holistic treatments, uh, treatment center. Uh, you have one in Oregon. I don't know if there are multiple ones. Can you tell us a little bit about the process that people go through there? Yeah, so it's, it's really, it's about, you know, the foundation is all in the book, um, but this is like an intensive for 30 days where people come to learn this language of the nervous system, to learn the intelligence of emotion, to learn basically the relationship between the mind and body is so important. And most of us have, especially high achiever, we've we've overused the mind and we're like discarding the body and that's extremely problematic. So in psychology, we talk about, you know, it's kind of like top down, bottom up and meaning the relationship between my mind and my body. And sometimes my mind can come first and take care of a situation. But in situation, when I am triggered, I need to first go to the body And then I can access my mind. Then I can access my conditioning and then I can change those core beliefs I'm operating from. So this is an intensive where people learn these specific skills and we practice them every day. And it's incredible. The result we see from this. What kind of, I mean, how do you keep metrics of of results in something like this? A, A lot of, you know, success rate are, they're very false based because they're based on, the outcome, meaning, so think if somebody has an issue, whether it's uh, with food or they have an issue with alcohol or with drugs or they have an issue with overworking, so they'll measure the result by are you able to stop the behavior? So if you can stop drinking, then you succeed it, okay? What's problematic about that approach is it's not looking about what is driving the behavior. So if your anxiety is driving the behavior, then wouldn't you want first to succeed by managing your anxiety? Because if you manage your anxiety, then your behavior will change. So this is what we teach people. And it's very false because we're obsessed with the the end result. It's constantly the end result. Like imagine you run a company and all you, all you look at is the bottom line. You're just interested in bottom line. Just give me that result. We're looking for these amount of sales, these amount of people, whatever. And in the process, you're bulldozing over the relationships of the people who serve you. And the level of anxiety is rising up in your company. And that eventually it's going to, there's going to be a tipping point where it's not going to go well at all. So we have to be able to be aware that this level of anxiety is really how we can measure success. The better we get at it, and not obsess about the behavior. The behavior might take a little time to change, but it will change. Absolutely will change. And when it changes for good, it'll be like permanent. 
And that's what we see. We help people shift from the mindset of like, I have to stop the behavior, stop the behavior. And we tell them, let's attend to your nervous system first. The book again uh, is called Addicted to the Monkey Mind. Change the programming that sabotages your life. And I, I assume it's available at out, all the usual places like Amazon. It is. Um, it is on Amazon. It's also, um, I've had a lot of uh, compliments on the audio book, uh, which you can get in 52 different. And that's really great because a lot of people who are really busy, you know, don't necessarily have time to read. So listening to it in a car, I highly recommend that. It's available in uh, hardcover and, and paperback and also in Kindle. Now, one last question for you before we go. People are going to read the book, but in the meantime, what is one action step the listeners can take to build and maintain a healthy mindset? I would say definitely learn to develop a uh, a breathing practice, take the time to do that every day. Um, even if you start with five minutes a day and the way I do it is I imagine that our belly button and our chest, imagine that's a round balloon and you just want to fill up the balloon with air. And when it's full, you want to empty it out and you just sit in a chair comfortably square and you just breathe into this fashion. And this is called, this is how, dogs and cats and animals breathe. It's a circular pattern of breath and time yourself for five minutes on your phone. And basically the only focus is to witness what happens. There's no other agenda trying to put the focus on your breath back and forth. You will start seeing results just from that because the nervous system will immediately feel different because you're attending to the nervous system when you're doing that. J.F. Benoit, everyone, uh, thank you so much for being on the show. I'd love to have you back again in the near future. Thank you so much for having me, Buck. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, again, change of pace here for you with uh, J.F. Benoit talking about the monkey mind. I'm feeling a little bit uh, like I got a monkey mind going on today uh, myself. I got lots of things going on, but it's important to think about these things and consider you know, consider what you can do about it. You know, it's funny. I think about the concept that he talks about, you know, really reminds me of a lot of what people in the meditation space talk about with regards to fleeting thoughts and being unable to focus and be present. And this is an aside, this is probably would be considered an insult to some people uh, in this uh, space, but what I find is that my monkey mind goes away when I watch NFL football because I, and I, again, really it comes down to, I think, you know, what can you focus on, uh, you know, and go back to your youth and think about when you didn't have all these things in your life, what can you just watch? What can you just do for a while and not think about any of it? It's very useful. At any rate, that's it. That's all I have this week on Wealth Formula Podcast. Uh, this is Buck Joffrey signing out. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.